All right. Great. Okay, Thank you have you all. I will play those bios at the end, everyone, because I know sometimes you step on right at noon and you, you miss getting to read more about the amazing panelists that we have. So welcome everyone to our February panel discussion. It is the systemic challenges of drug reform. So what I'd like to do is just set the stage. We've got three really amazing panelists. You know, we throw around that word expert and it's, I think life experience coupled with education, formation, and ability to think deeply, and ability to look beyond just the personal leads us to all be experts in one way or another. But when hope, when we're calling these panels, I'm specifically looking for individuals that can reach into a topic with a certain amount of sophistication and penetration so that we can learn something from the discussion, so that we can walk away going, wow, I'm really glad I spent that hour. I spent that two hours. And I'm really pleased to say that I feel that I have found three wonderful panelists for that with our discussion here. So what I'd like to do is invite each panelist to just take center stage for just a moment and share just a one minute glimpse of who you are in this present moment. So let's start with Peter Marcus. And I, I start with Peter because this topic came about because of a meeting that the two of us had and the way he inspired me. So Peter, you step forward first and yeah, hi. So it's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me. It is true. We were, uh, Kimberly and I were standing in a parking lot talking about homelessness and and the link to, um, to uh, legalization of cannabis was the topic we were talking about at the time. And we were like, ooh, that would be a great panel. So here we are. I am Peter Marcus. I'm the communications director for Terrapin. We're a national cannabis company based out of Boulder with um, Storm Longmont. We've been long supporters of hope um, in uh, working to eradicate homelessness. Um, Prior to coming to the cannabis industry, I was a political reporter in Colorado for about 14 years. Um, I last left off as the senior state house reporter for the Gazette, where we started coloradopolitics.com, which I'm proud to say now it gets a million views a month. So it was really quite a successful project and breaking a lot of political news. I miss it. Um, but I really do enjoy what I'm doing, working for drug reform and for righting the wrongs of a failed drug war that disproportionately impacted a lot of communities that we're going to be talking about here today. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Peter. That's awesome. Okay, next is Deborah Snyder. Deborah, if you want to share just a little bit. Hi, everybody. As you know, my name is Deborah Snyder. Uh, I work at Mental Health Partners. I'm a recovery coach. Um, and I help those who are affected by a substance use disorder. I have a personal history with both that and some of the, the challenges that we're gonna discuss today. Um, I'm really excited to be here. I'm also a little nervous, so bear with me. <laughs> it, understandably, these are hard topics, but uh, that really gives me just a moment before Steven says something to say that we're here because we want to open the discussion. We want it to actually be a safe place where it's, it's okay to not have all the answers. So with that though, Stephen, jump forward. I don't want to eclipse your introduction. <laughs> no. good. <laughs> good morning. So good to be with you all. And thank you, Kimberly, for inviting me to be here. I am a uh, life coach, relationship coach. I love working with people to uh, find what are the forces in their life and how can they direct them more towards where they want to go. Um, I have a background in about 30 years of spiritual practice from many different traditions. I've been uh, captivated by the question of how do we touch into and experience the transcendent, the mystical, through, um, through breathing, through yoga, through prayer, um, as a way of understanding ourselves. But I've also been quite interested in how our culture has developed and how we think about how we relate to each other and ourselves in ways that are empowering. Um, so 
that's what I've been passionate about. I'm also passionate about community. And I, I've been living in a cooperative community for the past nine years, and I've been part of many different communities. And I think we're facing the question as a nation of how do we live in community in ways that might be a little more constructive. So um, I've learned many lessons living in with lots of people. In fact, Kimberly was part of a community I was part of for, for about a year, and that's how we got to know each other. And, uh, yeah, it's, it's been a great path together. So great to be with you. Yeah, great to have you. Great to have you. So you. Um, we're going to dive right in. And what we've done when the panelists and I met is we sat and we really broke open a topic. And I really took notes because as you can well see, I'm, I'm far away from being the expert that these three are. But I took notes to develop a flow of what we thought would be a wonderful discussion to, to get you reflecting. And remember, we're not here to take stands for or against and all the divisiveness that's in the world, but we are all here for the same reason. And that is that we would love a healthy, happy, harmonious society. I think we can all agree on that, that we are all about that. So this discussion <laughs> is to demystify and to go a little bit deeper into a topic that may seem to have a really direct answer. And yet, if you probe a little deeper, you're going to find that that's not the case. So the first part of our panel discussion, if you haven't attended in the past, is I'm going to pose questions that came about and then they're gonna get a chance to share with you and respond and everything's recorded. So you can have the recording on Monday if you'd like. And then I'm gonna field questions from all of you or comments because I'm new at up-leveling our whole platform system. Bear with me, I think I, I got it. But if I make a mistake or I'm slow, just give me a moment or ping me again or raise your hand. So, <laughs> so what's a great starting point is to start with the topic itself and there are three components to this topic there's systems because we're talking about system systemic challenges there's drug reform which represents all element of substance and that is also a metaphor pointing to the topic of systems and then there are challenges so let's start with systems. What are we talking about when we refer to systems that make up our culture? And this one's in Stephen's court. You go for it, Stephen. Well, let me, you gotta unmute yourself so that we can hear you. Oh yeah. There we go. <laughs> I was muted. <laughs> you can't read my lips. <laughs> yeah. So, um... Yeah, what I was thinking of was that it's difficult to talk about this subject, which is so close to our morality and the sensitivities we have around how we govern ourselves and um, lead our lives and, and deal with addiction or pleasure without looking at what are some of the underlying principles of our culture itself and at the origin of our culture, such as like in the 16th century in Europe, in the Enlightenment, we had an, an ideology supplanted in our culture that had that replaced religion or the sacred at the center of society with science and rationalism and this Newtonian idea of force against force. And so when we replaced spirituality with science, um, basically we, we lost a sense of moral compass. And so the, um, what, supp what supplanted spirituality was this idea of competition and and the idea that human beings are actually not connected um, universally through their spirit um, so that sense of loss of common value is just showing up all over the place in our culture right now where we don't have a sense of principle or at least the principles that used to govern us such as good sportsmanship and scouts honor or just being kind have have been replaced by a sense of um a sense of competition with one another so anyway those are just some ideas about what what we're dealing with at the cultural level 
Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. <laughs> <laughs> then we jump to the end of the title. So drug reform. And Peter, obviously this one falls in your arena. You have such a vast experience, but what does the phrase mean? And what is it pointing to? And how does it reveal larger issues that we're talking about? Why are systems challenges coming into drug reform? Well, we finally started talking about drug reform through the lens of systemic issues. Um, you know, um, and when you're talking about drug reform, you're, it's, it's a wide net. Um, you know, the, the, the largest conversation taking place right now is over cannabis um, for obvious reasons. It's legal in a lot of states now, actually. Um, uh, a full third of the country now has recreational laws and much of the rest of the country is medical. So obviously, um, you know, that's the focus now, but you're seeing it in other areas. There's psilocybin pushes around therapy. Um, and um, just the notion of when we're talking about drug reform, we're talking about why do you need reform? What led us here? And the history, you know, when you date back to prohibition, especially as it relates to marijuana, is a history of racism. Um, it's an ugly part of our history that it's time that we reckon with and we face. Um, we created drug laws in this country with the purpose of targeting communities of color and leaving people behind. And so to unravel that, you're not, you need to look at it from a programming standpoint, you need to look at it from a system standpoint, but you really need to look at it as, uh, what are we trying to accomplish? You know, I think that people uh, assume that when we're talking about marijuana reform, that we're talking about business, right? Because that's the lens that it's been put through. And of course, there's no denying that. I work for a multi-state cannabis company um, that does very well um, and that uh, is part of a new industry with a ton of opportunity. So there's, it's hard, and we, you know, in Colorado alone, you're talking about 45,000 jobs, billions of dollars in, um, in sales and uh, million, hundreds of millions of dollars in revenue for the state. So it's hard to ignore that stuff. So that is part of a drug reform conversation. But when we're talking about drug reform, we're talking about righting the wrongs of the past, correcting what we did to um, hold groups of people down. And as it relates to homelessness and to the work that Hope does, you know, you're 13 times more likely to end up homeless just because you went to prison once, you know? And if you're an African-American in this country, you're four times more likely to be arrested for marijuana than me, even though I consume at the same rate. And so when we're talking about drug reform, that's what we're talking about. We're talking about um, addressing uh, the systemic aspects of it that led to the problems that we're facing. And in talking about legalization specifically, you're talking about balance. You know, sadly, um, Colorado wasn't focused on social equity and things like that when we um, when we legalized marijuana. Um, you know, in the defense of this state, the focus at the time was being the first state to legalize marijuana and creating the first regulatory structure in the world um really for cannabis um now that we're down the line the sky hasn't fallen um and more and more states are legalizing the conversation has turned to social equity so it's about balancing that business and corporate aspect of things that i just spoke about with um the systemic nature of things and the social equity aspect of it so that if we're going to have a multi-billion dollar industry, we're sure to lift up and create opportunity for those who were left behind. And so when we're talking about drug reform, no, we're not just talking about legalizing dope. We're not just talking about making money. We're talking about correcting the failures and inequities that we created from a broken system that was prejudiced from the start. Thank you. I really appreciate that. And one of the words that came up in our discussion before this panel, along the lines of what Stephen and Peter have just shared is the word reinvention. Stephen used it. Reform has 
unfortunately, a European stigma to it of a standing against, of a, of a divisiveness. And reinvention is a lot of what both Peter and Stephen are already speaking to. And that brings us to Deborah, who's, who's tackling the, the operative word challenges. Um, why can system be challenges? And what are some of the systemic challenges so that we can lay the groundwork for this discussion, Deborah? Well, thank you. The why I think is a perfect follow-up to what Peter was just saying. You know, when the drug war started four or five decades ago, we, the American public was inundated with economic and racial misinformation. Um, the language that's been used for the last 40 years has generally uh, targeted, like he was saying, minorities and, and folks with fewer, less socioeconomic means. Um, when the opioid epidemic began, you know, five or 10 years ago, that's when it first started to become not considered a moral failing as much as a failure in our communities. But clearly the people who are, who are victims of the drug war and the victims of communities that are disconnected, they don't get the resources they need. Um, using substances is the one thing that people know will work at least temporarily to ease their struggles. Um, and forgive me, I'm gonna look at my notes a little bit. Fortunately now, um, the disease model is very widely um, sought and um, I'm so nervous. <laughs> <laughs> um, what the first thing that came to my mind when we talked about this on Monday was trauma. Um, trauma and language are the two, I think, biggest challenges right now. So there's a lack of mental health resources, misinformation about treatment in general. Um, and so people are not, they're arrested and they're incarcerated, but the fundamental issue in their life, which is no resources and multiple, multiple, many decades um, of trauma, it's going to present what seemingly seems impossible challenges, but they're not. Um, all of these can be easily ta uh, tackled with a reallocation of resources. So there's a lot of hope, but the undertreated co comorbid disorders out there and the, um, the misinformation and the lack of community support need to be tackled. Yeah. So that's kind of what we're doing today. Yeah, that's we are. We are. We're planting seeds and we're going further with it because many of the people that are on this call, if not all, already have a deep heart for what we're talking about. And certainly you, you draw to mind the imperative of being a compassionate, right? How can we build a compassionate culture so that some of that moral principle that Stephen spoke to and the social equity that Peter spoke to, yes. that we're coming from a place that's fundamentally committed to that above all. And along that lines, while everybody brings an incredible amount of experience to uh, their life choices, Deborah is really in a field that is passionate to her because of her experience. So I invited her to share a little bit of her own story and some of the challenges in society that are wrapped into some of that story. Well, I, I do have an interesting perspective in that for probably close to 15 years, I was struggling with a um, opioid use disorder. And I was one of these textbook cases that you often hear about, especially with like the Pfizer lawsuit that's um, just been completed, where I, was, I had an injury at work, I was prescribed uh, narcotic painkillers and that snowballed into really a horrific substance use disorder. I, I lost my job, I, I lost everything. I became this, just, I, I lost who I was as a person. But during that time when I was incarcerated, I met these amazing women who had nowhere close to the resources that I have and decades, like I was talking about in the previous question, long trauma history. And it's difficult for me to understand a lack of compassion you have the opportunity and the gift to listen to the people that are most suffering uh, with this issue. So it was very enlightening to me. Um, and the resiliency of this population as well is inspiring and extraordinary. And so I'm, I feel very blessed to be in the field, but the trauma compounded with the legal challenges compounded with no socioeconomic advantages. We, we can't fix this because I was lucky, lucky enough to get resources, um, but there's so much punitive action out there that that only perpetuates and exacerbates an already awful situation. So 
I, I want to invite everyone to just consider, you know, if you're driving by and you see someone who's homeless and, and either using drugs or you think that's what they're going to do, please try to think about what has potentially led them down that road and the lack of opportunity, resource, support. And I, I thought it was great that Stephen brought up spirituality because there's a fundamental element of substance use disorder and it's very widely taught in like the 12 step groups where spirituality is a huge tenant to becoming reconnected to your formal, former self, to your abstinent self. So, um, but if you don't have people who care about you and you don't have anything that is remotely close to something that can help you succeed, you're going to continue to, to use drugs, get in more trouble, and the cycle continues for decades and decades. So people do not get out of the system. I was one of the lucky ones. Thank you. Thank you, Deborah. Yeah. Very powerful. And so <clears throat> that really seeds the ground for me to turn to Peter on this one. Peter, you already shined a light on so social equity in business, but break it open even more for us because we're in a culture where it's like part of our freedom is spoken about because we have the independence to make as much money as we want, right? We have the, the freedom to craft our lives and supposedly all the resources are there for it. You know, we've got this culture that, that boasts of having that. And yet that's not quite the case. And so often things are reduced where the, the bottom line actually is money, right? Or, yeah. or is outward success in ways that are somewhat looking like money. So speak more to us so we can understand what social equity is all about. You read my mind. That's the path I wanted to go down. Um, just to um, what Deborah was just talking about, though, before I get into that, with um, understanding the stories behind it, I think that that is so key, right, is we go about our days and we just don't think about it. And, uh, and it leads into what you're asking me, because it's like, now here we are, we legalized marijuana, you know, and like, I go about my day and it's about business functions, right? Like, um, are we still remembering? Are we still holding on to those stories that Deborah was talking about that led, you know, some people to um, to where they're at? And actually, I, I'll just plug it shamelessly. Um, one of my best friends is Vic Vela, and he's got this amazing podcast, Back from Broken. Um, it's all about it's on. Uh, he's with NPR, um, so it's an NPR broadcast podcast, uh, Back from Broken. Um, it's just amazing. It's all stories of, you know, people who struggled with addiction and came back from broken. And what you find from it is it's the least likely people, right? You know, it's like, you know, it, it's, it's stories from people who are next door to you or, you know, or family and stuff like that, that you can relate to. And it's because we just don't focus on it enough. So when you're talking about what the balance is between what we're doing with marijuana reform, which started as a grassroots effort to right the wrongs of the past and now embracing a multi-billion dollar industry, yeah, it were, I have to constantly be on my toes and, and remind um, our corporates, our, our corporation and everyone who works for us what this is about. So for example, um, this year we underwent as an organization anti-racist training. We um, partnered with um, this group uh, Kind Colorado. They spun off a great um, uh, cannabis impact fund. They're, the goal is to leverage dollars and support from the cannabis industry so that we don't forget what this whole thing was always about, which is righting the wrongs of the past and, and, and deconstructing systemic racism. Um, so as part of our commitment to Cannabis Impact Fund, we underwent as a corporation anti-bias, anti-racist training. It's very uncomfortable stuff to do as a corporation, quite frankly. Um, it's personal. It's asking you to challenge yourself. It's asking you to accept your bias um, and your privilege with when you maybe don't even know it, right? Until you start to tackle it and you start to face it. And to do that in a work environment with your coworkers, you know, can be uncomfortable. But we did it because we felt we needed to challenge ourselves. We needed to accept that there are unconscious things that are taking place. 
um, that we need to start to face and to have a reckoning with to um, imp a improve corporate culture for us, but really more to move the needle in the discussion nationally. And I think that corporate America can and should step up and lead by example. And I think the cannabis industry, given the roots in the in in reform and in impacting change needs to um, step up and be leaders on this issue. So what you're seeing now is an acknowledgement that yes, the cannabis industry is successful, but we can't lose sight of what our purpose is. And so in every application that we undergo now, um, not every, but just about every application that we see from a government now, there is a large community impact and social equity section. We can't open as a cannabis company in most new markets without proving to the government that we have a plan to lift up people who were left behind and to positively impact the community. Um, we launched with job fairs that are um, equity focused. We partnered with this amazing group out of Denver, The Color of Cannabis, that works with um, uh, African-American um, BIPOC community folks who um, are looking for opportunities in the cannabis industry, um, entrepreneurial as well, but don't have any clue where to begin, how to access capital, all that kind of stuff. We do trainings and workshops with um, the organization to sort of um, introduce folks to how to do that. And when we opened in Michigan recently in um, June of, the, of last year, um, we held an equity job fair that was run by Color of Cannabis where they literally screened applicants for us and gave preference to those who were harmed by the drug war because that's how you actually start to affect change. Um, so it's not just, you know, it, it's not just ideas. I think you're starting to see action. I think you're seeing the government take uh, start to pay attention. I think just the fact that they're requiring it as part of applications to open a store will force other companies that maybe aren't as um, focused on the issue of equity to do the right thing. Granted, you want them to do it for the right reasons, but if you can get them to at least start doing it, then they'll start to realize that this is just better for everyone, you know? Um, and so, yeah, we're taking what we've, what we started as a grassroots reform movement and we're applying it to how we operate as a business and where we funnel our dollars. You know, Terrapin um, ha has given over $600,000, will be over a million dollars by the end of the year in terms of the nonprofits we give to. And we do try to find nonprofits that have a synergy with us as a company in terms of righting the wrongs of the past, tackling drug reform, addressing homelessness, justice initiatives, educational stuff. That's the stuff we want to apply um, some of our corporate money to, to actually move the needle. So it is a balance. Um, I think the industry fell behind but you're starting to see more of a focus and more of a push and that makes me happy. Thank you, thank you. And so with, um, with the way Peter painted a picture, it's easy to see that one of the powerful things we can do is model, right? We, we can begin to be change makers by modeling the very things that we're talking about and that, that harkens back to some of these fundamentals that I wanted to invite Stephen on. And by the way, panelists, if you, if you decide you wanna add a comment or something, just take yourself off mute or, or ping me and I'll, you know, like if you wanna offer across. So, so Stephen, um, with your background in that, why are value and meaning, and I'll even add in purpose, why are they so foundational to this issue and this topic? Well, I think really what we're seeing with so much, um, so many issues with drug use uh, is just the failure of our society and our culture to give people a, like fundamental sense of meaning and connection and an understanding of their place in the cosmos. 
it's it's noteworthy that 87 percent of the population is either in therapy or wants to be in therapy if they could afford it so that's a staggering figure like nine out of ten people need mental health care and so i think that coupled with the, the drug problem that we have in our society are just symptoms of the lack of meaning uh, that people are experiencing in their lives and i think covid right now is really underscoring uh, the reality of our institutions are failing us. They aren't giving us a connection to each other, connection to a sense of purpose and meaning in our lives. Um, Charles Eisenstein wrote a book called The Better World Our Hearts Know Is Possible, which points to like, how do we help create communities and a society that where we care for each other. And it's inspiring to hear what your uh, organization is doing, Peter, to help correct some of these imbalances and wrongs because you know in our culture we have a law set up that corporations are required by law to maximize profit for shareholders and if they don't do that it's actually them breaking the law and so like laws like this absolutely have to be changed or citizens united which basically say corporations are people and can use money to influence government so like these kinds of policies point us to where actually we need to come back to a sense of what are our values caring for one another um, and placing life at the center of our society. Um, you know, there's, there's an idea that lives in our culture that people are fundamentally dark or evil at the heart, which was in Freud. He thought that man was a beast and aggressive and that um, over time, though, science has actually shown that people aren't fundamentally aggressive. Like babies, they've shown in, in studies, have been shown to be empathic at six months. Like a baby at six months can tell if someone's been bullied and will, will seek to reach out to, the, to that one who's been bullied. Or when they, when they hear a baby cry, they'll cry with them, which is like a fundamental sense of empathy. So these are just this, this understanding that we are at a time right now where we're reinventing and reimagining our humanity and that um, this is this is the time to recreate our institutions so that they serve us uh, and bring back a sense of compassion and care. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you. Right. And, and it's such a, a great opportunity for us to say that within our very nature as a human being, there is a nobility there is an aspiration towards the good and for the good. And therefore at all times, even when things seem to be entrenched or actually are entrenched, there is also the opportunity and the imperative that we look towards these deeper parts of what it means to be human and ask the new questions that do the reinvention you both are talking to. So on that note, Deborah, um, you mentioned that recidivism uh, is just, it, you know, it's. The system's not working on those levels. And how does society and gender and ethnicity, how does that play into all of that? And, and where are the challenges most evident in these arenas? So there's no way I can fully and comprehensively answer this question because there's so, there's so many layers and there's so many bullet points. Um, but based on my personal experience, and, and um, Peter, you've touched on this a lot today, is just the racial and economic inequality. And when you are punishing somebody for what is ultimately a disease and a mental health disorder, and you're not treating the root of the problem or who the person is, there's not even like culturally specific interventions that are being implemented. Um, people are going to recidivate. The core issue is not that they use drugs or that I use drugs. The core issue was multiple layers of really unfortunate circumstances and trauma. And injury, all of these things. So an individual isn't being treated as an individual, they're being treated as an offender or a criminal. Um, when I was in the system, I was in it for about 10 years, I was treated relentlessly awful. Um, it, it follows you everywhere, it still very much follows me. And my, my criminal record is going to always be a challenge, always, always. And I would not be able to rent if it wasn't for my partner. I would have not been able to get out of the system if I didn't have financial resources. So when you're when you're meeting people who have none of those things, it's, it's like literally impossible for them to create change in their life. Um, and 
spirituality, interconnectedness, community, all of these things have to happen. This, the, jailing people is obviously not working. We know this. There's been models in Europe that have extraordinary success when they connect people to purpose, just like you said, Stephen. Connect people to purpose. Give people a reason. Don't put them in jail for many, many months, and then they get out of jail. They have no transportation. They have no financial resources and then they miss court because they can't get there because it's below zero outside and they don't have a car or they miss the bus then they're charged however much in fines or a warrants issued for their arrest so someone like me who had extraordinary resources i was so lucky and the only reason i survived and got through the system was because of the people that were there to help me and i saw a lot of people especially of color when i was incarcerated who it be, and, and a lot of times it becomes a lifestyle. It's It becomes so ingrained. They've been in the system for so long. It's just naturally like every couple months, you know, I, I go sit in jail. Um, so people become institutionalized. They co become completely jaded and they're never shown that they, A, matter to the community, that they have purpose, they have value. And there are people who are willing to help, help them find that purpose and get them treatment and the, the resources. I don't, I don't even need to get into the statistics. I think everyone knows the resources, the financial resources that are being put towards uh, Department of Corrections and county jails is astronomically higher than it would be to support people in the community, get them jobs, get them training, get them a place to live if they so choose. I saw a question that someone asked, like, what do you do? And I know we're not supposed to be doing the questions, but what do you do when a folk when somebody wants to stay homeless? Entirely different story. But if people have get out of jail and they have a bus pass or a ride, that at least is the first step. Most people get out of jail don't even have that. They have the coat on their back and they have a paper that says you need to be at court at 8 a.m. in two days and report to probation. And if that doesn't happen, we're charging you $200 and we're putting a warrant out for your arrest. So gosh, I don't know. Why, why wouldn't that work? Why aren't people staying sober after that? It's it's awful. And Boulder County is one of the most fortunate of counties. And I don't even, I think about it all the time, especially working in the field about places in Florida or Baltimore and these cities where the jails are overcrowded. They're treated very poorly, which I still get treated poorly, um, not by my employer or anything, but I still get very much um, looked down upon, condescended to all the time when people find out my history. Uh, and again, I was one of the lucky ones. And I, I was saying when we met on Monday evening with this panel that I was in um, integrated treatment court, which is also known as drug court. I think I was the only college educated uh, inmate offender out of dozens and dozens. So I was also afforded different opportunities because I grew up in Boulder and going to college was something that was expected. So if it's not expected and you don't have those resources, you don't have those role models, of course, you're going to recidivate. Of course. Yeah, I just, I'll piggyback real there because I, and I, you know, you pointed out that I've been talking about it a lot and I think we're both talking about it a lot and Stephen's talking about it a lot for a reason because, you know, we, it's what it's about. <laughs> like this is, this is the issue, right? Is that, um, is that, you know, for so many years in this country, we've tried, you, you've seen policymakers try to explain, you know, why there's disadvantages and we need more affordable housing and, you know, maybe we need to do tax changes so it trickles down and, you know, like we, those are the conversations that politicians have been having, you know, until quite frankly, the last year, there hasn't been this like boiling point. Um, in America. And it resulted in the emotion you've seen in this country on both sides. Um, but it was a boiling point. And it's like, if we're not talking about what has led the systemic failures that led to this, then what are we even talking about? So yeah, like, of course, we should, we should keep talking about this, you know, um, in, in terms of, you know, what you were saying, Stephen, about, you know, the other, like, 
some of the things that are broken in terms of like a Citizens United and how like corporate money, you know, literally dominates these conversations. Well, that's why I go back to what Kimberly was talking about when she asked me about what are you doing in this new industry to balance what you're talking about is that if we are in a country where corporations can use money um, as the First Amendment right, um, then let me in this new industry use that money, you know, to actually affect some change. You know, the, one of the other groups that we work with, we, we work with five nonprofits in Longmont. The, another one we work with is the Reentry Initiative, um, which is a wonderful group um, that is making headway in this state. Let me tell you, if you probably take, I, I actually sit on the board of the Reentry Initiative just until, um, uh, actually, last week, my two year term ended. Um, and Deborah hit it right on the head. You know, I was astonished. I didn't know really. Um, basically, like you get out of jail and you're handed a bus ticket and a one night motel stay. And it's like, good luck, you know? And and that kind of stuff, like I knew was happening, but to see it, you know, up close and to feel it and to see the stories, uh, reentry initiative focuses largely on women exiting prison. Um, so hearing the stories of these women exiting prison and just the inequities of like check fraud, nine years in prison, you know, why did they write the bunk check? Because they had no money and they were going to die. And then they're not going to get hired because of that charge. Um, and then you're not going to get hired because of that charge. So if we in corporate America don't start talking about that kind of stuff and, and the stories that Deborah was telling and, and, and forcing the issue, uh, then we're wasting our time, quite frankly. So that's, I think, why we keep coming back to the issue here today. <laughs> Thank you. May I say something super fast? First of all, shout out to the re-entry -ent initiative. They're amazing and Ultimately, I think at least we know we agree up here on the panel that it's not a moral failure. These people who suffer from substance use disorder are not lazy and they're not immoral. There's a systemic fundamental problem with how our country has operated. And, and in my opinion, it's only getting worse. Sorry, I'd love to add I'd love to add to what you're saying about morality and and this stigma, because there was a some of you may be familiar with this study that was done with rats where um, Back in the 50s, they did a study with rats where they, they gave a rat an option of drinking water or heroin-laced water in a cage. And of course, it found the heroin-laced water interesting, so it drank itself to death. But then later, another scientist thought, well, that's not a very telling experiment. Why don't we change this up a bit where we give the rat water and heroin to drink, but we place it in an environment where they have other rats to play with. They have a playground. They've got toys. They've got fun things to do. And they found out when they gave this rat a context that was hu like <laughs> humanizing or that gave it uh, a sense of itself, it didn't touch the heroin. And, and so that's just like this beautiful statement that when we have a context of community and meaning and purpose, then we don't rely on, on substance to make us feel better, that, that can heal our pain. So, yeah. Thank you. That's awesome. <laughs> Well, you know, it's just, you guys have broken up an issue so well. I'm, I'm jumping over some of the questions because you've already included them naturally because you're, you're, you're so breathing the topic that we're talking about. And so let's, let's jump forward to the, the partisanship question because the mighty dollar one, we've already hit it, Deborah, you just talked about that, you know, partisanship. And it, it's really interesting because, um, I don't, I don't, I'm not politically oriented. My disposition is, is much more philosophical and spiritually grounded in how I might speak to issues. And yet as a culture, given a lot of our psychic history, really, of the way we try to make things black and white and right and wrong and good and bad, our attempts to do that show up in what we call partisanship. And so, Peter, I know you really spoke so eloquently to this Monday. How does that play into making me, to adding to the challenges? Um, so, sadly, I am politically oriented. <laughs> I, 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 I wish I wasn't. Um, 
you know, I, I spent a decade covering the state capitol, 14 years in total covering politics. Um, I'm entrenched in it. It's it. I know this comes as a shock to some people, but the cannabis industry is all politics. Um, it's um, literally, I mean, a huge chunk of my job is playing politics um, because that's how we're affecting change. Sadly, you know, I'm a believer still that you do work within the confines of the structure that we have. Um, you know, until we do burn it all down and build it back up um, and the revolution has won, you got to play with what you have. So um, in terms of politics, um, what we have done is used our influence and our voices to move politicians towards understanding what this issue is. So, um, you know, when it comes to cannabis reform, um, the conversation we're having with lawmakers now is about um, social equity. Um, you know, they weren't talking about marijuana legalization until we created a political structure for them to talk about it. So politicians are never going to be taking initiative. It's just not what they do. Um, they react um, and they react on what's going to get them elected and what's going to keep them in uh, popularity and how they're going to raise money. And so the reason they weren't talking about marijuana for so long was because they believed that uh, this would be a detriment to raising money and getting elected. And then all of a sudden, a few politicians started actually admitting that they're all about cannabis legalization and that they not only smoked it, but inhaled it. And the next thing that you know is they didn't lose their seats. Heck, they started picking up voters, a lot of them, and they started to uh, realize that they can talk freely about marijuana reform um, without the risk of, uh, of losing their, their seats. And so once we had them, once they could start freely talking about it, because like I said, they're reactive, you know, they don't take initiative, um, then you could start to get their hooks in them about the reform discussion. And now you can't talk about marijuana reform in Congress right now if you're talk not talking about social equity. Obviously, that's because Democrats control both the House and the Senate now. Um, granted, the Senate is still a 50-50 split. So, you know, it's, it, it's still very, very tight. But we have been able to shift the conversations to not just being about marijuana reform, but being about social equity. And I saw a question come through the chat lines about what the heck are we actually doing? Like, are we righting the wrongs? Are we expunging? Yes, we are. So in Colorado, just we literally just last year gave Governor Polis the authority to start expunging records, and he is expunging automatically marijuana records. There is a process, but it's happening. Same thing we're talking about in Congress is that we're not going to do banking, we're not going to do legalization, stuff like that, unless we talk about social equity and unless we talk about expungement. So actually, Kimberly, I think that we can move um, the needle by utilizing politics, and it's what we are doing right now. Mm, thank you. Thank you. That's a really, really wonderful reflection. And it can situate, I would imagine some of the questions and comments will kind of circle back to this immediacy, the world we're in right now. What can we do right now? Uh, what's possible? Uh, so to kind of seed that for these last couple minutes, when we were talking on Monday, we, we had a few other past history kinds of things to add to the problem and the challenge with our systems. And, you know, Deborah spoke, each one of you has spoken so well to it, but we haven't really used the word as um, in this discussion of belonging. How committed are we that our very neighbor feels like they belong? And I'm sure that every one of us, no matter what mistakes we've made in life, no matter who we are, there has come a time when we wondered where we belong or if we belong, or we thought we belonged somewhere and find out we didn't really belong. You know, when I, um, this is 
not at all on the level of drug reform, but it's the same light to shine on the systems. When I left the monastery after many, many years, I had no record in society. And you know, I couldn't get a cell phone for two years. I, I couldn't get food stamps. I couldn't get anything because I was not actually in the system. So even though I was a member of this community in the United States, I actually didn't have access to resources. And I left after having given my life for many, many, many years, more than a decade uh, to the service of humanity, I actually didn't even have access to food support. And when I finally was able to go and, and look at cars, well, I'm always able to go and look at cars. Uh, I had a family need where a family member might have had cancer. I couldn't even get a car. They wouldn't let me finance a car, even though I had a job and I had been in the system for a year or two years. There was concern that because I didn't have tax documents, that I might be a runaway felon criminal that's hiding from the system. And I could. I even took in pictures of me as a nun. <laughs> so, you know, look, this is what I really was. So that shines a light on the fact that our, our systems have limitations to them. So some of the underlying things that go into this topic, though, are things like the puritanical threads, right? Poverty, uh, what it means to be a success in our world, what it means that um, we are in a land of abundance and we've come here of our own volition for freedom. And so all of those are informed by uh, largely our European roots. And so I wanted to throw the baton out there. Let's start with Deborah or Stephen and open it up to Peter after that on, on these historical roots that need to be at least named. Sure. Here, will you talk first? Oh, is that okay? Stephen? Yeah, okay, great. Oh, sorry, I, that was my fault. I, I thought I was muting you. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, there's this old puritanical tradition of judging your neighbor, uh, or um, that it's somehow our place to police other people's morality. Um, you know, if you didn't go to church in Massachusetts in the 18th century, you could you'd be put in the stocks. So there is this notion of uh, somehow we're supposed to police each other's goodness. Um, and then, of course, there's all that judgment around poverty, that poverty is a sign of a lack of character, uh, where actually it's just a sign of a lack of money. And there's a, a, a wonderful solution to poverty is that you can end poverty by giving people money. <laughs> Turns out that's the most the best thing you can do. So those are a couple puritanical threads, I'd say. <laughs> I think it's interesting that you talked about belonging because I think that's a, a fundamental root of what we've been talking about here, whether it's racial or economic inequality, belonging needs to happen. People need to feel as though they're being invested in. And when we're in a capitalistic man eats man world and you are not given the resources to succeed you are being very clearly told that you don't belong that you don't belong and you don't have a future and i believe that our country is progressing and luckily we live in a county where um those folks who don't make as much money aren't seen as necessarily being lazy but there's so much work to do in other parts of the country and even here for people to really fully appreciate the lack of resources and the life someone's been given that you have never had to had to struggle with and then once you're in the system as i talked about before it's extraordinarily difficult to make any financial gains so connection belonging um that's that really does need to be where we start i believe yeah thank you thank you peter do you want to add anything to that I mean, it's a lot of what we've been talking about, right? Is like, so, you know, at Terrapin, you know, one of the, what I mentioned briefly, the um, anti-bias, anti-racist training we underwent, the course actually starts with our European roots, you know? It starts, you know, hundreds of years in the past to even start to talk about 
what we're talking about, which is learning how to be anti-racist. You know, the hardest thing with, you know, some of our employees was like, I'm not racist. We're like, we're not saying you're racist. <laughs> That's not what anti-racist training is. We're saying that you may not realize that there are inherent privileges that you have and biases that you have that are unconscious that you don't even know about. So you don't you really, you can't really start tackling that kind of stuff until you tackle your ancestry until you're until you go back and follow the history and you know again like fast forward to dr drug prohibition and that was a 1970s nixon era push to um hold down uh communities of color that's not a conspiracy theory that i'm saying it's well documented history at this point um so yeah, of course, you can't talk about any of this stuff um, without addressing, as you were talking about, European roots and ancestry and how all of this came to be. And I, I think that's the deep dive we're trying to take. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. That's that's brilliant. So we're going to that's we're going to start moving into if anybody has questions, you can type your questions in the chat box or in the Q&A section and I'll field them and then pass them on. And then panelists, you guys can just kind of take yourself off mute and jump in if you'd like. You know, when I first stepped on board at Hope uh, last year, one of the first blogs I wrote was on human dignity because everyone was stepping back and at first expressing a lot of gratitude to have a simpler lifestyle, you know, to, to have a, the suspension of all the activities that everybody was over committed to and an opportunity to do a little more reflection. I thought, well, what better to reflect upon than something as fundamental as human dignity. And one of the notions that I think is still so operative in our culture is this attitude of pulling yourself up by your own bootstraps. The fact that leaning into each other in an interdependent way is actually a weakness and that as a human being, you should be able to make for yourself the kind of successful life that society is telling you it means to be a success, even if it's a success of just simply having a home even if it's just that, not even having stocks and investments and things like that. And it really begs us uh, as, as part of our culture to take seriously the effects of these adages that reflect the prevailing threads of our past that lead towards our limitations. I can tell you there are so many volunteers that I've had a chance to hear their stories of why they got involved with hope and the reason they got involved with hope was because they had one view that got broken open by a human experience of what somebody was really going through that was either a participant of our programs or someone we served or someone in conjunction with it. That there was a prevailing view of, of the situation, how we may look at a homeless person standing on the corner to the intimacy of coming close to that very person and finding out that they have a history that never could have been imagined. And that's where a lot of our volunteers have come from was the intimacy and the immediacy of getting close, getting close. And I know Emily of the um, reentry initiative is here and we had a great conversation about that, that that is one of the remedies to get close to the very people in our midst. So, so let's start out with questions. Who has a question that they want to pose to these wonderful panelists? And uh, I'll throw it out there to everyone. You can feel free to, to type it right in. And I realized Chris in saying that I would answer your question. Let me see. So Chris Reynolds, city prosecutor, many individuals believe that homeless addicts are choosing that lifestyle. What is your advice when talking with people who believe being homeless and addicted is a choice? I know you, you alluded to it, uh, Peter, but does anybody wanna tackle that a little more? What might be our advice when we talk to individuals who have that judgment that Stephen referred to, that judgment on their moral I'd actually choice? Love to hear from, I'd love to hear Deborah's take on that actually. 
I, I work with a lot of folks who are experiencing homelessness and I would be very curious to know what it is about that lifestyle that they like and appreciate. Um, like as you just said, Kimberly, everyone's an individual. Everyone has a story. All of us would be better people <laughs> to listen to these individual stories and try to imagine where we would be given the same circumstances. But I, I, I know a woman like that. I was in jail with her. She's extraordinarily strong, resilient, resourceful, and she, she prefers to live outside. Um, and that's wonderful, but I would, I would be very curious, as I said, what is it about that that they like? And talking to them about what potential resources they could still utilize with that lifestyle and just let them know this is, these are all the things that are available to you. People can get housing and still use substances. People can get housing and still not get treatment. So there is availability, there's support out there. Um, I think when I think about someone saying that though, I think about the community that they feel they have in that environment and that that will be lost if they're in an apartment or everything comes down to feeling connected to other people, giving you purpose and speaking from my own personal experience, once you have that scarlet letter of a drug addict and a criminal, it's, it's easier to hide and not deal with the public, to not want resources, because I can't begin to describe how beaten down, discouraged, and condescended to people are. And I'm one of the lucky ones. And I, like I was saying earlier, I still get really poorly treated by a variety of different places. Um, so in summary, finding out what it is that they get out of that and either trying to support them in whatever way they choose to improve that lifestyle or just let them know what resources are out there and that you will help them access those resources. And I would guess that given the right connection, people will probably choose to go live indoors, um, especially if they know that they're not gonna be told they can't use their substances. But that's just the starting point. Eventually they probably would be interested in treatment and not using substances because they actually have stability. I hope that answers the question. Yeah. If I could add to that, that's, that's wonderful. Yeah. And I, I think so often we look at people through a label and a description and we see someone who's homeless or someone who's addicted and they, we just label them and we stop to see their humanity. And so I would say to that person who's questioning the person, person's condition as homeless, like, have you talked to them? Do you know what their story is? Like to actually access their humanity behind the label that you've just put on them. And, and, so, and I think when we start to do that, we actually start to see each other's humanity and then that can wake up our natural compassion and care because when we understand someone's story that oh actually this is just hard times that fell on you beyond your control then that's what starts to humanize us and that's what starts to give our society hope is that we start relating to each other from that deeper place of our universal humanity thank you thank you yeah great reflections and i know this came up at the last panel i think one of the opportunities that we have is looking into agencies such as HOPE, Reentry Initiative, the In Between, the R Center, the, uh, the Veterans Community Project, and so many more. I could name so many organizations, both um, government founded, um, health clinic founded, nonprofit realm, where you have individuals who have a heart for these issues. I know when I first stepped on board with HOPE, one of the things that really moved me was the level of intelligent, compassionate expertise of the staff with which I work. I actually welled up. I cried at our, the first whole, every, every staff meeting we had for the first month or two, I was like, I'm so grateful to be here with you <laughs> because they were not only serving their job, they were not only doing what it says we do, but they had a level of comprehension of all the things that we're talking with that they met the individuals that come to us. And I know Hope is one of many organizations that started in such a simple way, we were going out on the streets and we still do street outreach because there are so many people that don't even trust the system that provides sheltering and other temporary housing situations. There is such a distrust in even that level of essential service that we have individuals right in our midst who are hitting the streets, who are building the trust just by showing up two to three times a week with 
resources, with food, with clothing, uh, so that maybe one day down the road, that person may say, you know what, maybe I can actually trust the nonprofit that person's working with and take that step in the direction towards having some other's needs met in easier ways. Uh, I'm so glad you brought up trust, Kimberly, just real quick. The trust mm -hmm. and the distrust and mistreatment is often a reason why people want to stay in um, a lifestyle where they're not living in a specific address. There's so much trauma, so much mistreatment. They're so stigmatized, it's easier. So it would do us all good, like us, Stephen, you brought up, um, learning their humanity, being there, not judging, and just simply saying, well, do you have food resources? This is where you can go. Here's where you can get clothes. And then building that trust, hitting the streets, like you were just talking about, Kimberly, being out there regularly. So they know that you're not someone who's going to judge them or call the police on them. You're simply there to try to alleviate some of their hardships. And I will dare say that most of the people, especially this one woman I'm thinking of, she is literally the most, the strongest, most amazing, most resilient intelligent people I've ever met. I mean, I would be so much cooler if I had even like an ounce of her guts and just her um, ability to, to survive in adverse circumstances. Mm, thank you, thank you. Are you gonna add something, Stephen? I, I was gonna just question. add one thing, which is, yeah, I think <laughs> often we, we think, we look at society, we think everyone is relatively equally resourced or like we have basically the same capacities. And so why aren't some people just taking care of themselves? One figure that's good to know is that 15% of the population has an IQ less than 85. The military won't even take people with IQs under 85 because they've discovered that IQs that low means that it takes more resource to manage someone like that than the value they bring. And so then the question is, what do we do with 15% of the population that doesn't have that capacity that actually needs support for reasons that are beyond their control? And which presses a deeper moral question of like, what is the society we're creating and how do we relate to people who actually need support, which is not a product of their weak character, but of their humanity. And so what's the humanity that we can call forward that, that includes them? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, awesome. So the next question we've got, it seems like we can just keep unpacking one question over and over again. There's so much there, right? Uh, so Michael put in, and I know this was pointed to in some of your responses, but maybe there's even more to speak to it is, is there any movement now that reform is happening to reverse criminal charges or expunge individuals record, um, anything like mass pardoning Michael says uh, that could lead to restoration of opportunity and access to upward mobility among those who have been broken and held down by draconian laws. Anybody want to speak to that? Yeah, I mean, I spoke to it a little bit earlier. Um, so in Colorado last year, the governor, um, what we did was um, we had a bill on social equity. It was actually kind of exciting if you're a wonky political nerd like me. We were running a bill around social equity in the Colorado legislature last year. Um, there was a lot of back and forth about whether we could include auto expungements in there. Um, auto expungement is just where uh, prosecutors go through the databases, um, or it doesn't have to be prosecutors, but that you go through the databases and um, you find out the convictions. It's an administrative process to get it expunged just based on if you fit the criteria of what would, uh, what would fit under legalization, which is an ounce or less. Um, anyway, uh, it was a contentious conversation to the legislature. Um, uh, municipalities um, uh, were, you know, governments don't like when they get an unfunded mandate. You know, you have some cities like a Denver or a Boulder where that takes some serious man hours to go through the system and auto expunge. Um, and so there was some contention around it. Um, Anyway, what we did was we just snuck it in to the bill in the last second as an amendment. It stuck um, and the governor was encouraging us to do it because um, he wanted to see expungements. So we were able to get it in as an amendment last minute. Literally, it passed in the last uh, 24 hours of the session um, and we got it over to the governor who gladly signed it. We held a press conference out in um, 
in Denver, um, where the governor spoke, and he now has the executive authority to um, expunge those past marijuana convictions. I mean, I think it's telling that uh, we legalized marijuana in Colorado in 2012, and we just got around to that in 2020. Um, but um, other states and other cities that are coming online with marijuana are learning from what we didn't do right. We did a lot right. We got like a lot of it right. We became a model for marijuana regulation across the country. But um, the things we didn't get right, governments are taking a look at. So you'll see like in New Jersey, there'll be expungement caked into it. Michigan, we're starting to do ex run expungement fairs to get people expunged on it. So yeah, there's a ton of movement nationally around expungement. Um, ultimately, um, it's di you can't really, it's, it's one thing that's difficult to do on the federal level because you had to deal with expungements on the state levels for the most part. We can obviously like the vast majority of low level marijuana crimes or state crimes. They're not federal crimes, you know? Um, so it's still work to do, but, and it is a piecemeal approach, unfortunately, but yeah, we're making huge strides there. Mm, thank you, thank you. Great. So let's see, well, you all answered the question so well, we actually, nobody's posed, does anybody have any questions that they'd like to put out there? Oh, and I'm sorry, I forgot to pin you, Peter. I'm sorry, Stephen. <laughs> you had to stay very still. Uh, well, this has been really awesome. And we, we've had some wonderfully dedicated and devoted individuals on the discussion. And I'm going to give one last call for any questions, if anybody has a question. And then for our panelists, are there any, anything that you want to add in that you feel like we, we didn't cover? This panel discussion will be recorded. I'll have time to edit it mildly on Monday and get it to anybody that knows and I'll get it to all the panelists too. So Peter, Thank you, Deborah, Karen. yeah. This was, this was really great. It was an honor. Thank yeah. you. Oh, you guys created such, I keep using that word safe, but here we are talking about, uh, here we are talking about trust and belonging in our own culture, right? And morality and judgment and all of that. So even that we could in a small way have a safe gathering where it's okay to just share our thoughts and perspectives and and open it up more and you guys the three of you did an awesome job at doing that and and i definitely have learned a lot for sure so i what we're going to do is in just a moment i'm going to put the little slideshow back if you want to see a little bit of more of the background of each of the panelists you can stick on and take a look you can get a hold of me to get in touch with them you can type in the chat box right now if you'd like the email address of anyone and they can send it to you. Uh, and one of uh, Deborah's colleagues, David, was on, but he said a big thanks to Deborah for telling her story and sharing her wisdom, which is amen to that. <laughs> amen. <laughs> so, <laughs> so Peter just put his contact in the chat box for anybody that would like it. Uh, Steve put, Stephen put his, but he's going to type it again. And Deborah, if you want to put yours, and anybody can ask individual questions to you. And everybody knows how to get a hold of me because you, you signed up. So you, you've even got my cell phone number if you want to text me. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Penny, thank, well, thank you. Thank you for me. having us, uh, Kimberly. And we're looking forward to, you know, these are discussions, but we're looking forward to actually doing some stuff this year. Um, so, you know, I know stuff that, you know, we've already been discussing some very cool programs that Hope is working on in terms of like uh, parking lot um, resources and, um, and counseling and guidance and stuff like that. Um, so we're really just getting going. So we're looking forward to it. Yes, thank you. Well said, well said. Peter, yeah, thank you for fighting the good fight. Absolutely. Appreciate it. No, it thank you work. for 
both of you, I mean, and Deborah, your story is moving. And Stephen, you've, by the way, you've got a great radio voice. It put me, at, <laughs> put, 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 me put me at ease, you know? I, I feel like I'm, I'm having a better day after listening to you. You have very positive vibes. So appreciate Thanks. that. <laughs> Thank so you. you, Peter. Great to be with you all and meet you. And thanks, Kimberly, yeah. for having me. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. You, absolutely, everyone. You're welcome. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Have a good one. Bye bye. Bye bye. Take care. You too. Take care, all. <laughs> Big love. <laughs>